All right, it's uh, four o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good, doing good. All right, so I have some good, I have some good news finally for for the waitlisted students. So, um, so I talked to the department chair today, um, and so we're going to send out permits for everyone that's on the waitlist, and so you should be added to the class. I think those permits should go public well either this afternoon or tomorrow. There's uh, there's a lot. So I don't know if I don't know if it's going to get to all of them today, but. If not today, then tomorrow morning. Sure. Okay. okay. And then another announcement, uh, just because um, you know, I've, I've been kind of taking my time a little bit with the content, so we're not uh, we're already a little behind, but not not that far behind. But uh, so the homework one, uh, which was supposed to be due on Tuesday, I'm pushing it back to next Thursday. I think uh, we're still going to be covering some stuff on Tuesday that you need the homework that's due Thursday. Okay. Um, so I'm going to change that on Canvas when I go back to my office today. Um, and so the homework one, which is the first homework with with, with actual calculations, that'll be due on Thursday. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and so besides that, the plan for today is we're going to continue where we left off. And so I think we left off kind of right in the middle of an example. And so we'll we'll pick up where we left off there. Uh, so that should take us maybe about 30 minutes to finish up today, and then we'll go ahead and move on to the next topic, uh, which is called classical optimization. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions about anything before we get started for today? Okay. All right. So let's uh, so let's go ahead and continue where we left off. So I'm going to scroll up for a bit. Um, and so if you were here on Tuesday, you know I'm, I'm you don't have to write this down again. I'm just going to show I'm just going to show the example again one more time. All right. So here's the example that we were working on. And so uh, we're working on an optimization problem where we want to design the cross section of this supporting column. Okay. And so the two uh, design variables that we have to play with are one, the inner diameter uh, of this tube okay. or this uh, this column, as well as the thickness of the column. So little d and little t. Okay. Um, and so we want to find the optimal values for these parameters that satisfy. Uh, not only all the constraints, but also minimize the cost as much as possible. Okay. And so here I have listed all the design requirements. And so you know the the diameter of this uh, of this column it has to be somewhere between two and fourteen centimeters. Uh, the thickness of the column should be between somewhere between zero point two and zero point eight centimeters. Okay, so those are the uh, those are the restrictions on those. Uh, we also have requirements based on the uh, internal stress. And so the induced stress within the column has to be less than the yield strength. Um, the induced stress has to be less than the buckling stress. Okay. Um, and then finally, the, the final design requirement is that, you know, the, the cost of the materials should be kept uh, as little, as small as possible. Okay. And so we were kind of halfway through working through this optimization. Uh, and we're and we're kind of doing it using a graphical approach. Okay, so we're kind of plotting everything just so, just so that we kind of visualize and see kind of our design space and 
kind of where we're going with the uh, with the problem. Okay. And so first thing we did. Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, so first thing we did was we we worked on the constraints, right? And so first we worked on the constraints where you know the diameter has to be between two and fourteen, and the thickness has to be between zero point two and zero point eight. Okay. And so uh, we plotted this, and so we um, based on those constraints, we kind of came up with this rectangle which showed our kind of our space of viable designs or or or, or valid designs. Okay. Um, and so that's kind of highlighted there in the green. And then the last thing that we did was we also added this constraint of the um, yield strain. Okay. And so what we said was that if we computed the yield strength, um, or excuse me, the induced stress within the uh, the column, this has to be less than the yield strength of the material, which we found was uh, 500 newtons per centimeter square. And so that created another line for us to plot on our um, on our uh, figure here. And so that's what gave us this kind of purple line that's kind of sloping down this. Okay. Okay. All right. And so what that line basically told us that if we're if we're in that red section there, uh, kind of underneath that curve, then yes, while it's true, you know, the diameter and the thickness was within its 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 original kind of bounds. But if we were to construct a column with that, uh, um, you know, with those dimensions, then the column would just break because you know the the stress inside the inside the column. Would be greater than the yield strength. Okay. And so what that's basically done is that it's it's made our valid region small. And so now instead of that entire rectangle, you know, we're instead looking for um, design points that are within that green region, which is kind of like a is kind of in the shape of Montana, I guess, I guess you can kind of say Montana but reverse. <laughs> okay. And so the next step in this problem is we're going to incorporate the next uh, constraint here, which is the buckling stress. Okay. And so that's the final constraint for this problem. And so what we'll see is that the, the, the constraint on the buckling stress will make our viable region even smaller than it was before. Okay. All right. So that was just kind of a recap of, of the example from last time. And so, you know, um, you know, I didn't write anything new. This is this is all stuff we covered on Tuesday. So, you know, but I just wanted to recap that just because, you know, we were stuck in the middle of an example. Uh, but before I move on, are there are there any questions on on this example here so far? Okay, all right. So let's go ahead and, and incorporate the requirement on the buckling stress. Okay. Okay. So one requirement. Uh, one other requirement for a column is that the induced stress. In the column must be less than the buckling stress. Okay. And so we want to formulate this mathematically so that we can, um, you know, plot it on our on our on our um, Cartesian plane. Okay. And so, in other words, we want to come up with a mathematical expression that incorporates both of our design variables um, into this experiment. So first, let's let's come up with an equation for the buckling stress. And so um, the buckling stress, you know, may, maybe you maybe you went over in a in a previous class or not. But one one equation that we can use for the buckling stress is the following. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So we can compute the buckling stress by computing first the Euler uh, buckling load. And then we divide that by the cross section of the area of the trunk. Yeah. 
where the Uber buckling load is, is taken from, from beam D. So, you know, I think probably most likely you, you haven't seen this, but you know, um, this is this is kind of the equation for it if you have a, a cylindrical column. Okay. All right. And so the equation for this is that um, the Uber buckling load, its equation is pi squared um, times E, which is the Young modulus, times I, I being the moment of inertia of the cross section divided by L squared. And so basically what that expression tells us is that if we apply a force equal to that in magnitude, then that's going to cause the beat, the, the column to bump. Okay. And its roots are in kind of U or B theory. All right, and then we're going to divide this by the cross-sectional area. So the cross-sectional area is pi times D times T. So this expression here is one divided by cross-sectional area. So this is a good start. Uh, so this is a good start for computing the, the buckling stress. Um, there's just kind of one issue with this, is we need to plug in an expression for the moment of inertia. So I is the moment of inertia of the cross section. And so we have different equations for I depending on the shape of the cross section. So whether you have an I beam, you have an L beam, you have a square cross section, rectangular cross section, you have different, you have different expressions for I. Okay. And so for kind of a hollow tube um, or a thin walled tube, I should say, which is what we have, then the expression for I is the following: so I over eight times d times t times d squared plus t squared. So this expression here is for a thin wall tube. So I, I know I'm, I'm kind of throwing a lot of equations at you kind of right now. And so, you know, I, I want to kind of, you know, take a moment just to kind of step back. Um, so, you know, these, these, these are all kind of structural mechanics equations, but rather pretty advanced structural mechanics equations. And so, you know, this is not something I, I you know, I want you guys to memorize or I want you guys to really know. It's, it's just I'm kind of talking about them just to give a little bit of context behind this, this, this problem. Right? Uh, what I'm more interested in in this problem is, is more the, the optimization side of it. So once we get this equation, how do we visualize it on by plotting it and how do we actually use that information? Okay, but all this kind of background information about buckling stress and 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 moments of inertia, you know, that's that's kind of more details for an advanced structural mechanics. But um, you know, I'm just I'm just kind of explaining it here, just kind of give you context behind it. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug this expression in for i. Okay, and what's nice about this expression for i is that it puts everything in terms of our design variables, which is d and t, right? So we want everything in terms of d and t if we can. Okay. And so if we do that, and I'm going to skip a few steps just for the sake of time. And so after plugging in and then kind of simplifying it a little bit,
Okay. We get the following for the following equation for the buckling stress. So we get sigma buckling is equal to, and I and I've gone ahead and plugged in all of the uh, all the values for the parameters, so like the Young's modulus and the length and things like that. Okay. And so we have pi squared times zero point eight five. And to the sixth, so that is the Young's modulus, e squared plus t squared. Okay, we have a pi dt cancel out due to the cross sectional area divided by eight. This eight comes from the moment of inertia, and then we have the length squared, which is 250 centimeters. Okay. So our design requirement uh, for this column is that our induced stress has to be less than, than this, okay? In other words, we have sigma i, must be less than or equal to sigma b. Well, not less than or equal to, should be less. <clears throat> okay. And so we already have an expression for the induced stress from last time. Okay. And so from last time, we have a sig uh, expression for sigma i to be 2,500 divided by pi dt, okay? That's just the applied load of 2,500 newtons divided by the cross-sectional area, okay? And then based our, on our design requirement, this has to be less than sigma b, right? And so what we just saw for here, we're gonna plug into this side of the, uh, of the inequality. So that's, this is gonna be less than, less than pi squared, 0.85, 10 to the 6 times d squared plus e squared by 8 times 2. And so this right here, this is our new constraint. And so just like all the other constraints, the one that are, you know, uh, are bounded constraints as well as the, the yield strength, you know, we can plot this to kind of see what our valid region looks like after, after this. All right. Any questions on, on how we got here so far? Okay. All right, so that so that sounds great, right? So we have we have kind of another uh, inequality constraint here. So you know, uh, in theory, we should be able to plot this. Uh, unfortunately, this prop this expression here is very nonlinear, right? And so it's we can't get a y is equal to the function of x expression from this. What we what we've been able to do for all the previous constraints is that we were able to come up with an expression of t is equal to some function f of d, right? And so just like y is equal to some f of x, right? So that's traditionally how we plot things, or that that's traditionally how we we uh, we do, right? 
But here, because we have some t squared, we have some, some d squared, we have some d and t in the denominator, um, you know, it's, 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 it would be very difficult to kind of isolate um, t by itself um, in order to get this kind of expression, okay? Um, and so this is this would be this is a lot more difficult to plot than than just kind of plugging into your graphing calculator. Okay? And so we have to do something a little bit um, different, not too not too hard, just kind of annoying, um, which is to kind of uh, plot this point by point. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take that expression up there and then plug in different values for, for D and see what values of T result from them. Okay. And so it's kind of like a plug-in, plug, plug in, you know, almost like a plug-in chug. It's like you do it kind of several times. And then what you can obtain from this is kind of a table of values, right? And so for certain values of D, you can get uh, values for T as well. Okay, so let's say we'll plug in uh, all the even numbers for D. So two, four, six. Eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. We're plugging all these numbers in for d, uh, and then we're going to see what values of t result from from this expression. So those are the numbers that result. Okay. So this is kind of a general trick that you can do. If, you, if you're asked to plot a function where you have kind of a very nonlinear function, um, this is kind of one way that you can that you can you can plot it. Because right now what we have here is a bunch of pairs of points, right? So this uh, so this is a pair of points. This is a pair or a pair of coordinates, I should say. Okay. And so we can plot all of these individually on our on our um, on our Cartesian plane. And then connect all of them, and then that will that will become our curve. All right, any questions on this before I kind of jump back to the uh, to our plot? Okay, all right. So let's go ahead and jump back to the plot so you can kind of see how this uh, how this works. Okay. Okay. So we're back on this plot here. I'm going to go ahead and, and erase these kind of highlighted regions for now, uh, just so that you can kind of see what the what our new region will look like. Okay. Okay. So right now we know that you know everything within the box and to the right of the purple line is is valid. Okay. When we plot the uh, um, um, our new constraint here, you know it's going to look like the following. So it's going to look like it's going to kind of look like this. It's going to kind of start up here. Maybe it goes. Start up here. Right in the middle here. And ask him to just like. Okay. And just like before, you know, the valid region for this is going to be to the right of this of this line. Okay. And so now our valid region is kind of shrunk a little bit more. So now the valid region is kind of this one right here.
And then everything to the left of these curves is going to be um, is going to be in inbound. So go ahead. So let me go ahead and make this orange here. So this orange, this new orange curve that I just drew, this is due to the buckling constraint. All right. So you can see the buckling constraint has, has constricted our valid region even, even further, right? And so now the only region where we can look for valid design points are gonna be in that, in that green region there, okay? All right, any questions on, on, on this? We're done with the constraint. So now we can actually start, we can actually start optimizing. So we can, we can finally start, uh, we can finally start solving the problem. Okay, all right, so, so our, our valid region is set now, right? So we know, we know where we need to look for it. Um, now we just need to find out kind of where in this region uh, gives us the most optimal result, okay? Okay, so let's talk, let's talk about that. All right, and so just to summarize, our objective in this optimization, if the iPad can catch up, I think the internet is kind of shoddy right now. All right, I'll just talk. I'll just, I'll just talk over it. So the, the objective in this optimization is that is to find the cheapest design possible that satisfies all of the constraints. Okay, so we we've we've done all the constraints. So we we know what our constraints are, and we visualize it in our in our diagram, right? And so the, our final point here is to you know. Take our expression for the cost um, of the of building the column, um, and then finding out what's the cheapest one based on that. Why the internet? So I like it. Okay. And so let's go ahead, let's bring up our uh, equation for the cost one more time. All right, so the cost of building our column uh, can be computed from the following. So it's gonna be five times the weight of the column. So this W here is weight plus two times the diameter. And we know what the diameter is, so we don't need to plug it. All right, just like just like we did for the um, just like we did for the moment of inertia, let's let's put everything here in terms of D and T as much as possible. Let's go ahead and replace this uh, this expression for weight, okay. and so you know weight is equal to volume. times the density. Okay. And in this particular problem, we're given the weight density. So the weight density already accounts for gravity. So we don't have to, we don't have to uh, multiply by G. Okay. So we just have to compute the volume of the, uh, um, of, the, of the column. So the volume of the column is the cross-sectional area times the length. Okay. And so the cross-sectional area we know is pi E times T. The length is L, which is fixed. Okay. And then the density is given to us, but I'll just give it the symbol rho. Okay. Area, length, 
And this here is the principle. Okay. And so the um, so for the length and the density, we are already given the, those are already given to us in the problem. So we can just plug in the values for those. Uh, pi is pi, and so you know we know what pi is. And so plugging everything in, the cost of building the column is nine point eight two times d times t plus two d. All right, so just like we've been doing for um, you know for all the constraints, you know we want to be able to visualize this in our in our kind of our design space, okay? And so just like we did before, we're going to come up with an expression that we can plot. Okay? Luckily, this expression here of nine point eight two times dt plus two d, this is a linear expression, and so we can solve for t uh, quite easily. Okay, and so what we're going to do as soon as my as soon as the internet catches up is uh, we're gonna set the cost equal to something fixed. And so we're gonna set the cost equal to, to big C, um, and then we're gonna solve the expression for little t. Okay. okay, so if we do that, so we have big C is equal to 9.82 dt plus two d. It's really bad to me. Whenever the internet is bad, um, because I, I used, to, I mean, I I used to live with my cousin and stuff like that. I always used to blame my cousins for streaming anime. So, um, <laughs> like, Odie, stop streaming anime. I'm trying to work here. <clears throat> Come on, almost there. It's literally like two. It's literally like two minutes behind. <laughs> when I, when I All right. So we have big C is equal to nine point eight two d times t plus two d. Okay. And so now c is a constant, right? And so c is uh, something that is it's not a function anymore. So just so that we can plot it, let's solve this for t. Okay. All right. And so to solve for t, I'm going to subtract 2d from both sides, and then I'm going to divide by 9.82d. Okay, so we have t is equal to c minus 2d divided by 9.82. And so if you remember on, on Tuesday, you know, um, we, we're going to get different curves depending on our value for C, right? And so this gives us basically a family of curves to test out different objective values. I wrote something. I swear, I, I didn't. I didn't just freeze for, for the last twenty seconds. There we go. Okay. All right. Like watching a real life replay of your life. Okay. So plugging in different values of c will give us different values, right? So if we plug in c is equal to fifty, right? That means this that would be a design that costs fifty. Fifty. Uh, well, we'll call them fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Because uh, a $50 structural column is, is a little bit too, too cheap. Okay. okay. And so we're, what we're going to do is we're going to plug in different values of C. We're going to plot its uh, plot its trajectory through our design space, right? 
that we want to see what the most value of C that we can use that still intersects our, um, our valid region, okay? There we go. Valid design. There we go. Good job. All right. So what's the most value C that we can use to still give us a valid design, right? And so this is this is kind of the question that we started with. It's just now we've, we've kind of put it in this optimization framework and we kind of created this kind of visual tool um, to kind of help us um, see what that see what that is. Okay. All right. So after this, I'm going to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to snap back to our, our curve from above. So are there, are there any questions on, on this before I kind of snap it snap back? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and snap back to our, our curve or our plot and let's plot, uh, let's plot different values of, of C, okay? Okay, so let's start with C is equal to 50, okay? And so if we, if I plug in C is equal to 50 and we plot that curve, you know, it would look something like, like this. Let me clear a little space here, so I'm gonna erase some of this red stuff here. In fact, let me use a color that stands out. So I'm going to use blue. Okay. And so I use uh, C is equal to 50. It's going to give us a curve that looks like this. Okay. okay. And so if our budget was $50,000, um, then we can make a design anywhere on this curve. And you can see we have we have plenty, we have, we have plenty of, we're, we're very clearly in the valid region. Okay. Okay, but can we do better, right? And so that's that's the whole point. That's that's kind of why we're going through this entire exercise, right? Um, and so if we were given a budget of fifty thousand um, dollars, you know, and and we wanted to spend all of it, then then you know we'd be happy. And so we we basically can see from here that we can come up with a valid design, basically anywhere on that blue curve that intersects the green region. You know, that would be a design that costs fifty thousand dollars and still satisfy all the requirements. Okay. And so in this case, we have a family of different uh, different options. So lots of different values of D and T, lots of different combinations that satisfy. Okay. But let's see if we can do better. Let's set C is equal to 40, and then let's uh, let's plot that curve. So if we set C is equal to 40, something like this. And so with C is equal to 40, you know, everything on that curve, every design on that curve would cost $40,000. Okay? And you can see that we're still, we're still very much in the valid region. Okay? And we can continue this. And so if we were to plot, let's say, what color should I use? Maybe light blue. Okay? And so we can set C is equal to 30. C is equal to 30 would be somewhere over here. All right, so C is equal to 30 would still would still be valid. And so and so we can uh, we can still optimize more. And so now the question is, you know, how low can we go? Right. So how low can we set C um, so that we can still be in that region? Let's go, let's try going down by another 10. So let's try C is equal to 20. I'm gonna clear some space here just so we can kind of see it. Okay. All right, let's try Okay. And so in pink there, I've drawn the curve for C is equal to 20. So if our budget was $20,000, you know, then we're kind of limited to, um, to to entries on that curve. Okay. All right, but we have a problem when C is equal to twenty, right? And so that curve C is equal to twenty, 
does not intersect at all with the green region, right? And so what that's what this is telling us is that it's not possible um, to construct a column with a budget of twenty thousand dollars because you know we, we create a column that would break, right? And so under the given constraints, basically what we're saying is that under the given constraints, we're not able to construct a column with twenty thousand twenty thousand dollars. And so the optimal, right? And so you can see, even with the C is equal to 30 curve, we still have some room to move to the left, right? And so the optimal um, um, design is somewhere between 20,000 and 30,000, okay? All right. And so you can continue this. And so you can you can kind of try a bunch of different curves, right? And you're definitely free to kind of check, check my answers with this. But the most, uh, the most optimal design, I'm kind of running out of colors here, we use red, yes. Okay. And so the most optimal design is C is equal to 26.53. Let me go ahead and draw that curve. Wait, it's becoming so. All right, so this so this red curve that I just drew here, this is C is equal to 26.53. Right. And so when you first look at that curve, you know, you might you might think that you know this is an invalid curve, right? So because it doesn't intersect the, the green region. But it actually does. And so right at this point right here. Uh -huh. Uh, oh, was there a question? Sorry. Uh, so right at that that point right there, you know, it kind of barely touches the the valid region. And so there's kind of just one point on that on that curve which is valid, right? And so that's going to be our optimal design, right? And so it has the minimum price, okay? So it has the minimum cost, but still provides a design um, that is valid. Okay? And if you were to um, kind of find the coordinates of that point, that's going to be our optimal design. Our optimal design in this case is D is equal to um, D is equal to five point four four centimeters, and T is equal to zero point two nine. Right, question question from the chat. So how do we know this one's optimal? Yeah, good question. So you know. Um, our objective function in this case, or, or the, the function that we're trying to optimize over is the cost, right? And so designs with, with, uh, with lower cost are gonna be more optimal than designs with higher cost, right? And so we could have picked something on the blue curve, right? So the blue curve has costs equal to 50 and we have valid designs there, right? Because so we have designs that were, are valid and so they're, they're able to satisfy all the constraints. Um, but there's a difference between designs that are valid Versus design versus the design that's optimal, right? And so, if we wanted to, we could spend fifty thousand uh, dollars on this on this column, and we get we get a column that's very strong. It's not going to break, right? Um, but you know, we could have we could save a lot more money if we tried to do go for a cheap design. Right? And so the the cheap and so the most optimal design here is the one that costs twenty six uh, twenty six thousand five hundred thirty dollars, um, and it has exactly kind of one point within that value range. And so in optimization, you're basically, you know, a lot of times you're kind of skirting, kind of trying to skirt the edges. And so you're trying, you're finding the design that that has, you know, that has the minimum value of your objective function, but still satisfies all the constraints. And so most of the time it's going to be just kind of one point, just like just like that. So that was a very that was a very very long example. Um, you know, a lot of plotting, and, and probably your notes probably a lot more messy than, than this. But you know, hopefully through this example, you kind of you know it starts to kind of a lot of those terms that we kind of that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks are, are kind of starting to click. And so what it means for um, you know for something to be a constraint, you know, how do we visualize that? What does that mean? Uh, what is the objective function? What does it mean to have more optimal solutions than than others? Okay. All right, so you know, I wanted to start with this. You know, I this I know this example kind of almost took an entire lecture to go over, 
But, you know, I, I wanted to go over this in, in a lot of detail because I think it is really useful to kind of visualize this and kind of think of things in terms of the design variables and, you know, what it means to be optimal. And so hopefully this was useful. And then as we kind of get into more kind of the mathematical techniques, um, then you'll kind of remember this example and, and kind of what, what it all is. Question is. Yeah, how did you get D and C from uh, the C value? Yeah, so, so, uh, so the C value here, you know, of course, you know, um, I found this C value just through a lot of trial and error. And so that C value that I obtained there was one where you it, it just had one very small intersection with the, uh, uh, with the valid region. And so that D and T values are the coordinates of that point. Oh, so yeah. You by like plotting it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or, or it's more like the textbook plotted a bunch of a bunch of a bunch of lines, and then they found the one which had just one intersection, and then that D that value of D and T is just kind of the coordinates of that intersection. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Question. I'm assuming we're going to use MATLAB, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so this so this plotting method is very imprecise. So no, so no one does this in, in practice. So this was this was just kind of an illustrative example. Um, so for the first half in the class, you know, we're gonna do more kind of hand techniques. And so we get kind of a more precise answer with hand calculations. And then more in the second half of the class, we'll be doing more math lab stuff to get this to give us this. Yeah. Yeah, but no one, no one in the right mind plots a bajillion curves and finds the one with the with the very small intercept. <laughs> yeah. Especially for like 3D, 4D problems where you can't really do this. This really only works for 2D, 2D problems. Yeah. All right, any final questions on, on this example here before we kind of move on? Okay. All right. And so uh, so that was, so, you know, hopefully that example was, was good. I think halfway through, everyone forgot that we're designing a column. It seems like we're just kind of plotting stuff in, in a Cartesian plane. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to, um, you know, um, I would call kind of more actual optimization algorithms. Okay. All right. And so starting today, you know, we're, we're what we're going to be going over uh, most mostly uh, are, are things of what I call optimization algorithms. Okay. So now that we kind of understand what an optimization problem is, you know, what we're looking for in terms of, you know, how we, how we approach it and, and what all the different terms mean, you know, there are lots of different approaches or lots of different strategies to actually solving these optimization problems. And so a particular strategy for solving an optimization problem is called an algorithm. Okay? And so we're going to be going, going over lots of different types of algorithms in this class. Okay? And so where we're going to start, um, which is kind of the, the which is kind of the uh, you know the place that where most where most textbooks start um, are methods which I call classical methods. So these methods are called classical methods because these are the these are the methods that people use uh, before computers kind of became a thing. And so, you know, for all of the kind of the you know 19th century mathematicians who didn't have computers, you know, this is this is how they solved optimization. Okay. Right. So in particular, you know, the, the methods that we're going to go over in this part rely on differential calculus. And so we're going to be taking derivatives of functions, we're going to be setting them equal to zero and using that to find the uh, extreme. Right. So, so, so some of the techniques that we're going to use, uh, that we're going to learn, especially the one-dimensional techniques, uh, you may already know them. And so you might have already gone over them in your calculus classes kind of long, long ago. Okay. Um, and so, you know, those same methods of, you know, how do you find the minimum of function? How do you find the maximum of function? You know, those techniques are still going to apply here. And that's, and that's technically optimization. 
Okay. Okay. And so let's start with um, the single variable case. And we're going to start with single variable unconstrained optimization. So we're actually we're actually going to um, you know leave the constraints away for now, and then we're going to bring them back bring them back. Home. Okay. So single variable optimization basically means that our objective function only is only going to have one design variable. Okay. All right. And then what we want to do in optimization is we want to find the minimum, um, the global minimum of this function. The emphasis here is on global, right? And so, you know, for, for certain functions, especially much higher order polynomials, you may have things that are called local minimums, where, you know, if you kind of look, if you just look in the neighborhood of a local minimum, you may think that that's, that's as low as the function may go. But if you kind of explore a bit more, then there may be a, a, a place that's even smaller. So for example, so let me go ahead and plot one just so you can see. All right, so let's say that we have a function f of x that looks like the following. So let's say that it looks like this. All right. And so it's some, maybe some weird, you know, six order polynomial or something, or something like that. All right, and so if we look at this function, we have two minima here. And so we have this one and this one. A minimum is just kind of a low point of the, of the function. But we can characterize these minima based on kind of where they are kind of relative to each other, okay? And so the first minima, right? So we can see the function is gonna come down into a valley, right? And then go back up. And so this is what I would uh, describe as a local minimum. Right? Because uh, in its relative neighborhood, you know, that's the, that's the lowest point in its relative neighborhood, but it's not the lowest point of the function overall. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the lowest point is what's known as the global minimum. And so there's the global minimum is the absolute lowest point of the, of the function. So let's go ahead and define these. We have local minimum. And so local minimum is the lowest point of a function in its relative neighborhood. So just relative to just kind of everything around it. Okay. Whereas the global minimum that's the lowest point of the function. Overall. 
so throughout, throughout the entire entire domain. So pretty, so pretty straightforward. All right, and so if you remember from from uh, from your calculus class, you know there's there's a relatively easy way to find the minimum of a one D function, okay. and the explanation for that can actually be explained uh, quite simply, kind of geometrically. Okay. And so at all extrema, so at both minimums and maximum. So whether it be a local minimum, local maximum, global minimum, global maximum, even saddle points, we'll talk about saddle points in a second. Okay. And so at all extrema for, of, the, of a function, the slope of the tangent line at that point is going to be zero. Right. So in other words, if we take the derivative of the function, take df dx, and remember when we take the derivative of a 1D function, we get we obtain the slope, right? The slope of the line. And so we take this uh, the derivative, we set x is equal to x star. Okay. Or x star right here, this is the location of an extrema. That has to equal zero. And so the first step in, in the classical method is very, very simple. So we take our function. Um, and for everything that we're going to be going over, in, at least in this part of the class, we're going, to, we're going to have an explicit form for the objective function. And so all you have to do is just take the derivative and set it equal to zero, um, and then find and then solve for x. So that's the first step. Okay. The first step is to take our objective function, um, you know, take its derivative and solve for x. Okay. Depending on the problem, you may, you may get multiple values of x, right? You may get a, um, you know two or three values of x. Okay. Uh, but you know, at, at all of those values of x, you know the function is at an extreme. All right, but we're not done yet, okay? Because those values of x there can correspond to any extreme. So it can correspond to minimums, it can correspond to maximums, uh, it can correspond to local minimum and local maximum, uh, or it can even uh, correspond to a saddle point. And so, you know, we need, we need another step here to determine where the minimum of the functions are.
Because all we've basically tested for at this point is we've just we've just tested for a location where the slope is. Okay. And so if I were to draw kind of the curve again. Okay. So the curve would look something like might look something like this. So here we have a maximum. Here we have a minimum. And here we have a saddle point. All right, so a saddle point is, is, a, is, a, is a location on the function where it just kind of flattens out on its own, but then kind of continues on in, in its uh, in its width. Okay. So for the maximum minima, you know, those are those are kind of points where the function kind of reaches a peak and then kind of changes direction after that. But for a saddle point, it kind of flattens out and just kind of continues on. And so at all of these locations, the slope of the line is, is zero. And we don't have we don't have a way to determine or differentiate between those, those three unless we kind of go to the next step. All right, let me pause here for a second though. Are there are there any questions on this so far? Okay. All right. And so the next step, uh, the next step is to determine you know, what each of these points are. Right? So we found the parts, we found the points of the function where the slope is zero. Um, now we need to now we need to characterize each of them. Okay. All right. And so the next step is actually to take more derivatives. And so at this point, we're going to take sec the second order derivative. Most of the time, taking the second order derivative, that's that's enough. But then we may have to take a third derivative, a fourth derivative, and so on. Okay. All right, so we're going to take the higher order derivatives, and we're going to plug in the values of x that we found in the previous step. And this is where this is where things get a little bit a little bit complicated. And so you know there there are kind of four possibilities. Okay. And so the first possibility is that you know when you take the higher order derivative and you plug in a value for x, then you get zero. Okay. So if you get zero, uh, what that tells us is that we don't have enough information. So we need to kind of take a higher order derivative and then kind of repeat this process. Let's say take the next. So that's the first possibility. All right, second possibility is that after you take the higher order derivative and you plug in x and you get a positive number.
if you get a positive number and the current uh, derivative order is even, and so it's either two, four, six, or eight, um, then you have then the location that you're looking at is a minimum. The next possibility is that you've taken the derivative, you've taken the extra derivative, you plug in the value for x, uh, but you get a negative number. Okay, so instead of positive, you get negative. If you get a negative number and the order, the current order of the derivative is even. Um, then you have a maximum. And then the last case, the last case is that if you get a non-zero number, so positive or negative, but the derivative order is odd, so it's either three, five, seven, nine, then you have a satellite. All right, so it sounds it sounds complicated. It sounds like there's a lot of a, a lot of cases, but kind of once I think once we do a couple of examples, it, it'll become um, it's pretty easy. Okay. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm pretty pretty sure you probably have, have kind of seen this in in calculus before. Maybe not all the cases kind of laid out like this, um, but you know I think I think the, the the concept of taking derivatives, setting it equal to zero, you know, finding those locations, and then you know taking the second derivative to find a max or minima, you know, should hopefully be uh, familiar to you. Okay, so I think we have time for kind of one last example today before we, we wrap it up. Um, and you can actually, you know, actually after this, you can you can kind of get started on the on the homework. Um, any questions on, on this so far? Okay, all right. So let's do one one quick example. No plotting on this one, I promise. It's all it's all just uh, very simple. Okay, so we want to find the minimum um, of this function here. We have f of x is equal to x squared is 8x plus 16. Okay. All right, so we have a simple, a simple quadratic function. Let's go ahead and run through our um, our methodology, here, right? And so we have a one-dimensional function because we only have one design variable here. So we only have x, and so we can go ahead and take the derivative. Okay. Okay. 
So let's go ahead and take the derivative. I'm just going to go ahead and use the uh, the power rule for for this. Okay. Uh, so the derivative of x squared is going to be two x. The, the derivative of uh, minus eight x is going to be minus eight. And then the derivative of plus sixteen, which is a constant, is just going to be zero. Okay. So we're going to take that derivative um, and we're going to set it equal to zero and uh, solve this expression for x. Okay. Okay. And so if we solve this expression for x, I'm going to go ahead and move the eight positive eight to the other side. So I'm going to have plus eight plus eight. Okay. And so that gives us two x is equal to eight. From here, I'm going to divide both sides by two. So this gives us x is equal to four. Okay. And so this tells us that there is an extrema at x is equal to four. We don't yet know, we don't know yet if this is gonna be a, a maximum or a minimum, or it could be a saddle point too. And so let's go ahead and run the next test. We're just going to take another derivative um, and then see the sign of that um, of that expression. Okay. okay, so we have d squared f dx squared. Okay. We're just going to take one more derivative of this. So derivative of two x is going to give us two, and then derivative of minus eight is just zero. Okay. So we have d squared f dx squared is just a constant, which is two. So two is a positive number. Um, and so since two is a positive number and the current derivative order is two, right? Our, our, uh, we're, on, we're on the second derivative. This means that X is equal to four is a minimum. Professor, because that, that fits in the category number two, right? Because we have a and plot. So the nice thing about one dimensional functions is that you can plot it. So you can plot it in a graphing calculator, you can plot it in MATLAB or Excel or Google Sheets, you know, whatever your preferred plotting method is. So let's go ahead and plot this to confirm. And so if you plot this function, it'll look something like this. And so you can see that indeed, you know, the minimum of this function is, is four. Actually, based on the way I drew it, I kind of miss it a little bit. So it's a little bit to the right of four, but it's, you know, imagine that I have good drawing skills and that I was able to draw the minimum at, at four. But, okay. All right, any questions on, on this example here? Yeah, um, Professor, 
Okay, all right, so let's let's stop here for today. And so uh, the next example is a little bit lengthy, and then the next example of that is even more lengthy. And so I think we'll save those for uh, for Tuesday. Okay. Um, all right, so remember, if you're on the wait list, I think you should, the department should reach out to you pretty soon with the permit. Um, just keep in mind that if you're enrolled in another uh, elective at this time, you won't be able to enroll and vote. And so once you get the permit for this class, you can go ahead and drop the other one and, and, and sign up for, for this. All right, so thank you guys for coming today. Uh, hope you guys had a, have a good uh, weekend. It's a long weekend, so uh, so there's no class on Monday. It doesn't affect our class, but it, it will affect your, your Monday sessions. Okay. Um, also, another note, if you send me an email this weekend, I probably won't respond because I'm going on my bachelor party this weekend. So I'll be either somewhere between very drunk or incapacitated. So, um, so yeah, so I'll, you can email me, but I probably won't respond to you until Tuesday, and I'll probably be very hungover. Then. So, you know, just, just support me. So, hope you guys have a good uh, weekend, and I will see you on Tuesday. <laughs> Take a shot for you guys, sure. I'll be taking many shots. I think. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So so the so uh, when we took the second derivative, yeah, we found a positive number. So if your if your second derivative is positive, then what do you count for the positive? In this case, the the second derivative was a, was just a constant. Yeah. But normally, and and so you'll see this in the next example. Normally, your second derivative will be a function of x still. And so if you plug in x is equal to since this is just a constant too, then it's uh it's a negative it's a it's a, it's a minimum. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that that'll still be due on I think on Wednesday. Yeah. So I think I think you should have you should have everything in. I'll, I'll send an announcement to that. I, I I made I made those homework assignments over summer, and so I, I realized I haven't really talked about it in the class yet. So yeah, I'll, I'll send an announcement for that today. All right. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Y